Welcome everybody to Drive Through Sports with Adam and Paul. Adam Freeman coming to you from Atlanta, Georgia. Paul Brees is with us in Brentwood, Tennessee. And uh, Paul, I don't, you know, emotionally today, today had to be kind of tough for you. However, I'm I'm sensing that possibly with our uh, there's a little theme to our both of our backgrounds. We we did these backgrounds um, without prior knowledge of one another. Um, and it looks like my background is at the beginning and yours is more like the end. What, I mean, being a huge Vol fan, is this a good thing for Vol football or is this a bad thing? Well, Adam, let me just say, it's never a good thing when your coach gets fired for possible sanction violations. Yeah, he wasn't just, he wasn't just fired. He was fired for cause, which means they don't have to pay his buyout, which may help them in getting a new coach, which, we can discuss that as well, but uh, we're talking about multiple um, multiple violations here. Now, former leaving has nothing to do with that. I think he's just done <laughs> with the whole. Uh, thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let, let's let's retract. Um, uh, as as a Tennessee fan, that the, the uh, it, we're starting to become a laughing stock, and once was a uh, you know a promising football school. Uh, that when I was growing up was very proud and, you know, had a lot of rich history and we've gone from, um, you know, Derek Dooley to uh, the Lane Kiffin uh, sneak out the back door uh, resigning to, uh, you know, Butch Jones brick by brick. And now Jeremy Pruitt who felt like he was at Alabama and could get away with, some of the things that may or may not occur in Alabama uh, as he's probably realized very quickly that, you know what, not everybody's going to help me out at Tennessee. I think the whole state of Alabama would do whatever it took to get as many five-star kids down there. And listen, am I saying this the right way? Right. You, you're going to have to have integrity to, but, you know, sometimes as we all probably can guess, you got to, you got to play the game. And Jeremy Pruitt realized that, you know, the state of Tennessee, that's not how we play the game. Uh, the Crimson Tide will always stay on top for a reason. So out the door, the Band-Aid was that, you know, that's my, my conspiracy theory, right, of the whole thing. Uh, but the Band-Aid is Kevin Steele, uh, who, no, we're not going to call him the interim head coach, right? Um, but – I think that 100% this guy was quickly brought in as the trickle down effect was taking place and they needed some, um, you know, they needed something to stop the bleeding and Kevin Steele was the guy because there was about to be a mass exodus of players and bad things were about to take place. And, um, it was not well, going to be looking well. It good. already started. I mean, I, I mean, Chandler, your best running back, transferred to North Carolina. That should have, that should have been a clue that something was afoot in Knoxville for all the Vol faithful and all of Vol nation. Because Tyson Chandler, I mean, he's your he's your best back, and he's well, like he's like, dude, I'm out. Well, I, yes and no. I would agree with you in one retrospect, but then. I would also say that Eric Gray is our best multi-purpose yeah, back. Gray, yeah. uh, Eric Gray is reminds me of um, Alvin Kamara. Can do a lot of things. Uh, not going to run anybody over, but uh, he can make the uh, home run play. And here's my problem with it, right? Eric Gray was uh, all of a sudden, you know, at the end of the season – affiliated with possible sanctions, right? That now they never really came out and said that it just so happened that he was not eligible to play in the last game. Um, and against, I believe it was Texas A&M. Yeah. Which is a scary situation that possibly your best offensive threat now or next season uh, may be ineligible due to whatever did or did not occur. Uh, but anyway, well, how do you, those are my thoughts. Yeah. And, let me, let me and, throw this out there at you. How do you think you got it? I think Cade Mays is feeling right now. <laughs> well, 
<laughs> I do know that Cade Mays uh, is probably going to come back, is what I've heard. I mean, um, why? So, I mean, I guess why wouldn't he? I mean, what's he? What is he going to do? Transfer for a second time? <laughs> you know, I mean, right. he, he barely. They barely got him eligible this time. Yeah. Um, the, the, the issue that I have is, you know, coaches come and go. They recruit these kids. They make all the promises to the parents. They're going to take care of them, look after them. And they either get fired or they can leave on a whim. And they're left these, left these players that they, you know, recruited kind of high and dry. Um, and uh, we're just in here now. Smokey has uh, entered the transfer portal. Uh, I think so. He <laughs> he is looking for a new team uh, to be the mascot of. Um, maybe somebody in the uh, arena league will take him on um, and, and give him a good home. Um, but uh, he, the rumor is that he could be out, he could be out as well, uh, which will be a which would be a huge huge um, shock to Vol Nation. Um, I mean that's that's like taking Ugga out of Georgia. So uh, yeah. It's um, you, you just we gotta you know I, I feel for that I feel for that 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 hound dog I really do, um, but you know, here's the here's the real thing here let's let's look at this this is yet another SEC coach it's fallen by the wayside, and last week Nick Saban wins his sixth title at Alabama, these are all things that are related, every team in the SEC wants to be Alabama tries to be Alabama. They just need to realize that they can't be Alabama. And there's only one team in the SEC that has figured that out. And they're continuing to get better. And that's the University of Kentucky. Why? Because <laughs> now, because now, listen, because now Mark Stoops knows, I mean, Kentucky knows who it is as a program. They're continuing to get better recruits. He is the second longest tenured coach in the SEC. How has he been able to survive the Nick Saban carnage that South Carolina hasn't, Tennessee hasn't, Georgia hasn't, Florida hasn't, Arkansas, Mississippi State, Auburn, Ole Miss, okay, uh, Texas uh, A&M, all Vanderbilt. the program, Vanderbilt. Texas and all these other, all these Missouri, all these other programs are just like, they're like changing coaches, like they're flipping hamburgers. I mean, it's like, it, but Mark Stoops, I think he's going into his ninth year, second longest tenured coach in the SEC. Started out rough because he was, he was inherited, I think he was two and 10 his first year. He was, he inherited all the Joker Phillips guys who were terrible um, with the uh, exception of Randall Cobb. And, you know, it, he's, he's built, he's built, you know, a solid, a solid program. Now they were four and six this year. They did win a bowl game. So they're five and six, um, four and six and all SEC, SEC schedule. There's probably a couple games there that they should have won, but I'm, what I'm hoping is their new offensive coordinator is going to change things up, going to open up their offense next year. Uh, they got Bo Allen and Joey Gatewood. It'll be interesting to see who comes out of spring camp with that job um, because uh, it's uh, it's going to dictate kind of where, because they've been power run for the last three years. <laughs> and uh, so it's going to be, it's going to be interesting to see. And I think it's promising what, what the university of Kentucky football program has in the pre or the post Terry Wilson era um, and the post Eddie grand era. Um, so We'll see, man. But you know, Pruitt and Fulmer out in Knoxville. Um, well, what, three three years. Yeah, like, I, I I've got to mention this because you know Fulmer is kind of uh, Johnny Majors and and him are you know Tennessee football, right? Um, yeah. You know, the outsider looking at a unit looking in are probably saying, okay, wait a minute, they're both out. You know, Fulmer, like you mentioned earlier, didn't fingers crossed, do anything wrong, knew of anything that was taking place. I mean, this guy's 70 years old. He knew going in, he was not going to be in it for the long haul. He was just kind of the guy that was going to try to bring some stability. Obviously, that didn't really set in. 
But him stepping down was based on the fact what he said today was the new AD can get his person and we need to find a guy that's going to be here 10 years. And he knows he's not going to be the AD when he's 80 years old. So he wants to, uh, you know, basically start anew. And that's the way he feels like he can help this, uh, athletic program that way is to uh you know step down and, and enjoy yeah retirement. i mean yeah and i mean he's i mean he's evolved he's evolved for life and uh he wants to do what's best for the program like you said fingers crossed he's not involved in any of this stuff i don't think he is i agree totally with yeah. your assessment there that he was not going to be they need a guy that's going to be there 10 plus years um that's going to be able to guide this program and make a good decision when it comes to the next coach um and whoever they get hopefully that'll be the guy you know, I've heard rumblings that they're, you know, if, if Kevin Steele is not your guy, what about the guy from um, Coastal Carolina? Um, Don't want him. Up and comer. Uh, but he's got a little bit of baggage as well. So, you know, gosh, I mean, if Kevin if Kevin Steele is the interim, I mean, this is another thing you run. Who are you going to get? Like these SEC teams that dump their coaches because they – can't beat Alabama, they can't win an SEC title after three years. Like, what do they expect? We talked about this with Auburn. Like, what do you, what do you expect to do? I mean, you're not going to beat Alabama. I mean, when they, they send 18 guys to the draft every year and still they're unbelievable. So, anyway, now on to a little home, home, hometown news here. Justin Fields today, Harrison Grad. Uh, runner-up in the uh, national championship last week to the uh, Alabama Crimson Tide, declares for the NFL draft today. What do you think his uh, prospects are, and where do you think he's going to find a home? Well, what do I th- – listen, I mean, when you got Trevor Lawrence, you know, the best – I mean, they, they're saying Trevor Lawrence is is so much of a, a, a ready-made uh, – Kind of like Andrew Luck, right? They, they compare well, they're talking to, about, yeah, they're talking about Trevor Lawrence, like an Andrew Luck and a Peyton Manning, a no doubter. Yeah. You know, like for sure prospect, no doubt. He, there's absolutely no bust in him whatsoever. Yeah. So here, my, here's my take on fields, man. Um, I, you know, Urban Meyer to the Jaguars, which we called here on drive through sports way before it happened. Oh yeah. Um, we did. You got to understand, uh, would he like to coach Justin Fields? Yeah, sure. He would like to coach him. But Trevor Lawrence is the guy he really wants to coach, right? Um, so I, I've also heard that the Jets are packaging uh, a, a, a deal together, and they're trying to broker an opportunity for Deshaun Watson to come to New York um, in exchange for the number two pick. So could the Texans end up? with Justin Fields in what is a huge mess down in Houston. I mean, it is a garbage dumpster fire of a Tennessee Vols-esque type situation down there. Yeah, I mean, when, when did you think you you would say that the Jets situation is better than the Houston Texans <laughs> situation? Did you ever did you ever think in a million years you would hear you would hear that or or think about that and 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 even that come out of your mouth? Because the Jets just, I mean, they they won three of their last four games. I mean, they, they played well. So if you're trying to get, you know, you know, maybe you're packaging Darnold and a couple of guys and a draft pick later, a couple of draft, you'd have to do a couple of draft picks for Watson, I think, um, high draft picks, um, like like possibly, you know, a, a protected first rounder in, in, a, in next year's draft uh, to get that done. But, but, Watson wants out, man. And what's correct? He just signed a four-year contract and he wants out. That's how bad it is. Um, you know, JJ Watt talking about how the locker, you know, the locker room issues, guys not not trying, not playing hard. And, and you know, I wouldn't be, you know, be surprised if his days in Houston are done uh as well. But you know, Fields, the Falcons are sitting there at four, and they need a replacement for Matt Ryan desperately. Now he's gonna play next year. And I think he's probably going to play the year after that as well. But he's 36 years old. Um, and the Falcons need, I mean, if you're ever going to have, you know, because here's the thing, like, if you look at their other needs, 
they need a running back and they need an edge rusher. I don't know that you've got super marquee guys at those positions unless you unless you want to say, you know, Najee Harris at four. I don't know if you draft a running back that high anymore, like the Giants did Saquon Barkley a couple years ago. I, I don't know. I don't know where just looking at the Falcons at number four, where do you think they ought to go? Because we're going to assume that Lawrence is gone and Fields is probably gone. Um, he's not going to stick around. So you've got the guy from BYU and you've got the guy from like North Dakota, Trevor Lance, I believe. There's a lot of talk down here yeah, about he getting did, him he in. He's very, season, right? he's very dynamic. Um, didn't play this season, opted out. He focused. He did. He did. He didn't play for North Dakota or North Dakota State, and strictly right worked on his uh, game. You know, uh, basically worked out. So now the question is, how far behind or ahead do you think he is? Uh, well, he's fresh. He hadn't. He hadn't had a. He hadn't had a year's worth of beating and pounding on his body. So well, let me let me mention him, this but... about the Falcons. Let me mention this about the Falcons. Um. You know, and I normally I, I, I leave that to you, but let me say this. Arthur Smith, the offensive coordinator, former offensive coordinator for the Titans, now your Atlanta Falcons head coach. It's not mine. He's just I just live here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I Everyone, never claim him. I will never claim, claim him. No. This guy, Arthur Smith, will find a way to make Matty Ice, <laughs> Matt Ryan, a uh you know, a contender again, uh, someone that is relevant. Uh, he will put him in good situations. Uh, he will somehow reemerge a possible Julio Jones or someone on the Falcons roster offensively that ha has hit the, the bottom of the career. He, he will re-energize it. Now, my well, second point is this. He has got a connection to the Titans' former defensive coordinator, Dean Pease, who took the year off this year, uh, in which was very evident by the Titans' defense, horrific, uh, did not even have a defensive coordinator. Uh, Vrabel and, an, and another uh, assistant coach were working co in hand, uh, hand in hand in, in, in a co defensive coordinator's type situation. Dean Pease, probably one of the smarter guys with blitz packaging. And if he goes with Arthur Smith down there, I'm calling it right now, Adam, as we've called a lot of things on drive through sports. <laughs> I'm going to say right now, the Falcons will be back playoff contention. Wow. That's a bold statement from four and 12 to playoffs. Now it helps. It, well, it helps with the expanded playoffs. Obviously you get a seven in instead of six. So that does help. Uh, and you're, and you're going to be playing in a division without Drew Brees. Okay. And Carolina, which is, you know, <laughs> week at best right yeah. um and so you got brady who could be the def could be a defending super bowl champion we're gonna talk about that uh nick uh here upcoming but um you know arthur smith is always he loves the he loves the uh the zone the zone the zone running game right that's big and he loves to have big backs like henry you know is he gonna push to draft a running back because the Falcons have nothing. They have because you got an aging, beleaguered, injured Todd Gurley. He he was only a one year contract. He's not going to get re-signed. He's out in Atlanta. It hasn't been announced, but they're not going to re-sign him. His workload just decreased as the season went on. His productivity did as well. Um, they're going to have to draft a running back now. Do they do they get the the big name running back or do they? Do they go with um uh oh I have to plug in the old the old PC? So do they go do they go with a with a big name or uh, do they hope to find uh you know light you know just a third round somebody that's in the third round that they can um that they can hit a home run with um you know, I don't know. He's going to have to have somebody that can run the football because that's what he loved. He likes to do first. And, uh, 
you know, that's uh, that's just what I'm thinking. But you know, is he going to go? Is he going to go with that right off the bat at four, or do they want to wait? Uh, well, so they can I, see what they can get. I'm going to mention one name for you, and this guy uh, has been uh, re-energized, right? But he will be a free agent this year. Leonard Fournette. Leonard Fournette. In that in that division. Yeah, I mean, oh. splitting time with Ronald Jones, he's he's fresh. You could tell how fresh he was the other night against New Orleans. I mean, pfft. they just gave him a hard time all night um, running the football. So, um, I mean, it's a possibility. I mean, reach out there and get him. I mean, he was a fifth overall draft pick two years ago for the Jags, and um, – you know, it's a possibility you could see him in a, in a Falcon uniform. Absolutely. But uh, all right. Let's, I'm going to give you my last name. All right. I'm going to give you my last name real quick. Ready? Yeah. Drafting second round. Or if they could get a combination here of multi first round picks, Najee Harris, Alabama. Second round for the Falcons, you talking about? Listen, I don't know. But I'm going to tell you right now. Can they package this so-called – and can they, you know, can they trade the four, maybe get like a, a you know, multi-picks in the first round? I don't think Najee Harris – do you think he's going in the top five? No, that, I really don't. Uh, that's what I was saying. Like, I, do, you, do you take a, a chance drafting him that high? I don't know that – I don't – you know, I don't know that you draft in today's game, you draft a running back in the top five, even the top ten. I just think right. it's all it's all about the passing game. It's either going to be quarterback, defensive back, uh, or edge rusher. I just, you know, that's just, you know, those are the three positions that affect the game the most in today's game. Now, if it was 30 years ago, then, yeah, you might do it. Um, but, you know, the, the, today's NFL is about the passing game and uh, run, run second, pass first. Uh, there is no more well, here's what, here's run what to set have. up the pass. Here's what you got to have. You got to have 40 year old quarterbacks if you want to win. Well, you got to have experienced quarterbacks, that's for sure. Um, I think we proved that. Josh Allen is the anomaly, and we'll get to that in just a second. All right. So, Rodgers versus Brady this weekend. Who you got, Paul? Because I, I can't afford to have any, either one of them. As well, you know. I, <laughs> uh, I did. I, I think if I received word correctly, Antonio Brown will be out this week. Um, I don't know how much of a factor that plays in. I mean, he didn't catch that many. He had, he had what, two Maybe targets? Two targets? Yeah. One catch for 10 yards? I mean, they don't need him. Uh, um, I don't think he's part of the big game plan. I, look, Mike Mike Evans, one catch, three-yard touchdown. That's all he had. That's, that's all he great. had. And Antonio Brown, one catch. So what? where did the damage come from? Came from Ronald Jones, Leonard Fournette, and the turnovers. That was the ball game right there. That was it. Um, so, Tom Brady, I mean, <laughs> he's he's done more with less many times before, yeah. and he's still got Chris Godwin. He's got the Scotty Miller, who's 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 emerging, you know, as a guy that he likes to get the ball to. He's kind of a Wes Welker type guy. Um, and he's got this guy Johnson from Minnesota who made an incredible catch uh, the other night um, that I think he trusts. And then, of course, he's got Gronk as a safety outlet, you know, uh, who's probably doing a better job blocking in the run game than he is catching balls this year. But that's what they need him to do. That's what he's going to do. The, uh, the X factor in Rodgers versus Brady, maybe the weather, Paul, it's going to be about 22 degrees snowing. Uh, your typical uh, Green Bay uh, at home NFC championship game. Uh, it's going to be interesting. I can't wait to watch it. Um, I, I, I'm a huge Aaron Rodgers fan. Um, just He's just kind of effortless in uh, what he does. Uh, he's, they seem to have everything, everything going. Um, they got defensive line is really good. They're going to get challenged, though, uh, with this Tampa running game. 
Um, but who's going to be, you know, is, who's going to make more plays, Rodgers or Brady? And that's what it comes down to. Um, I think, you know, the last time these two teams played, the Bucks blew them out. They blew their doors off, like 35, 34 to 10. Um, and then after that, Green Bay just went on a run and just nobody could even stay with them. So um, I think I got, I think I got Green Bay in this one, uh, winning at home, going to the Super Bowl. What you got? I do too. I mean, it's not, a, not even a question. Uh, yeah. I think Brady gave him a good run. I think they gave him a good chance. Uh, uh, you know, I think their defense is really well. Uh, but I think Green Bay with the weather is just uh, a factor you can't emulate in practice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can't exactly um, turn on the AC in your indoor practice facility down there in uh, Tampa St. Pete yeah. and, uh, and do the same thing. <laughs> so we both got Rodgers. We both got uh, Green Bay winning this weekend. Let's head to the net, the other, the AFC championship. Dude, return of Bill's Mafia. You see the hat? I've been recruited, Paul. I'm part of the Bills Mafia, apparently. Um, I got a phone call yesterday. A uh, good buddy of mine uh, who I teach with, taught with for years, um, played baseball at the University of Buffalo, uh, Marty Mazikowski. Um, he's actually a, a one of the sponsors on our Hawaii Nation sports broadcast. Um, and uh, he, uh, I, we've been going back and forth all season with the whole Bills Mafia thing. And I'm you know, trying to get some insight into what, why they're called Bill's Mafia and all this sort of stuff. And um, so he gave me some nice little, little tidbits, but he said, he, he just say, Hey, you're going to be at home. I was like, yeah, I'm quarantined. So yeah, I'm going to be at home. So uh, he dropped this hat off yesterday and uh, been wearing it ever since. So um, I, I'd love, I'd love to see Josh Allen and the Bills go into KC and get the W is Patrick Mahomes going to be playing. That's the thing. That's the question. Okay. I mean, I saw the hit. You saw him try to get up. He was obviously woozy, off balance. And, um, yeah. you know, hey, listen, I've been an athletic trainer for over 20 years. Okay. When that happens, like, I, and I understand their protocols and everything, but look, when I had a kid that had a concussion, they, there's, they never played the next week. Even in a perfect situation, in a perfect situation where their, their symptoms subsided in 24 hours and they, they took their uh, impact concussion test within 48 hours and it was back to baseline, it is still a, about a five-day progression to get them back to where they are playing, okay? Seven to 10 days, most concussions symptoms subside in seven to 10 days you got less than 10 days. You got five. Okay. So he's in concussion protocol. And for, for those that don't, don't know, that's what the concussion protocol is. You go in, you have cognitive testing. And then as, as long as you're asymptomatic, you start with step one. And if you can go through step one without symptoms and you go to step two, three, four, and five, that's the protocol. It's the same protocol we use in high school. So it's going to be interesting to see if he is available and if he's not, you're going into the AFC Championship game, possibly without Clyde Edwards-Alaire again, and without Patrick Mahomes against Buffalo, who's playing out of their mind right now. Um, I just, I think even, I think even with Patrick Mahomes, I think Buffalo can still win because when they played them early in the year, they were without a bunch of starters on defense due to COVID, so. Again, the COVID issue may come up. What if it comes up this week? A key player for either side tests positive. Then, then you got a major problem. Uh, so, um, again, it's nice to see Bills Mafia back after 25 year absence of the AFC Championship game when they went on that run where they had four in a row, they won four in a row, couldn't win the big game. Uh, what it would do for that city, uh, I think, is quite remarkable. Uh, but what, what do you think, KC? you know, versus a, a diminished KC possibly versus uh, the Bills who are on a roll? Well, you've mentioned everything that, that needs to be said, right? Mahomes plays. Um, I'm, I, I'm heavily leaning KC. Um, you know, even though the Bills held Lamar Jackson, you know, basically out of the end zone, 
Uh, but Mahomes is a different guy, right? I mean, yeah, he's different. This guy can sling it around, looking at you straight at you or not looking at you at all. <laughs> um, and I just don't know if the, the Bills Mafia is ready for, you know, this to take place. Now, if Mahomes doesn't play, I mean, Bills fans yeah. find a way to get to Tampa just to hang out down there. Because yeah. You don't know if this is if if you're going to ever get back to the Super Bowl. Listen, if I had to do it all over again, back in uh, '99, 2000, down in Atlanta, you, you, Georgia, you'd have been in Atlanta. You'd have been in Atlanta I, partying with Ray Lewis. <laughs> I mean, I'm sitting here 20 years later thinking, "Hey, I can't." Yeah, really. I can't believe it. The Titans have not made it back 20 years later. Uh, a lot of the you know, Titans fans are, are just suffered. And for me to not have a chance to go to the closest Super Bowl that will ever happen for me personally, oh, yeah. to not make it and go down there just to be in the atmosphere, I may not have gotten in the game, obviously, but yeah, and, and I've regretted it ever since. And yeah. The Bills fans, book it right now. Get on that Southwest flight <laughs> and get down to Tampa ASAP because I got I, – I, I think the Bills are going to pull it off. I, I mean, I do too. I, I, feel, I feel pretty good about it. All right, so um, let's get down to this deal. So I am in day one, two, three, four, five. I'm in day six uh, of my 14-day quarantine. Now – my school district uh, saw it, uh, I guess, saw the light and decided, hey, we're, you know what? The cases in our county are skyrocketing and Freeman's quarantined. So we just needed, everybody just needed to do all virtual. We'll just go all virtual for this week. So everybody, I was going to be virtually <laughs> teaching anyway, but now everybody's virtually teaching in, in the county. So we're, now we're going from, hey, we're, we're, we're some face to face, some virtual. Now we're all virtual this week. Now, you know, I get I get out of my quarantine on the 26th, which is next Tuesday, a week from tomorrow. Ella, who actually has COVID, she gets out of it on Friday. Um, she's feeling good. She's in fact, uh, she mentioned yesterday that she was bored, and she goes, "I'm bored. I think I'm going to do some schoolwork." <laughs> so, <laughs> See, when, when your 17 year old daughter says that, you know, it's bad, right? Like, like, you know, like she's exhausted. I mean, she's like cleaned out her drawers. I mean, she's done everything because she's stuck in her room. Like she's in isolation up in her room. We all luckily we're, we're blessed to have three bathrooms in this house, uh, three full baths. And I have the downstairs bathroom. In fact, I've slept down here the last couple of nights because Leslie was having, uh, thought she was having some symptoms, but didn't know if it was related to COVID or not. So we were just being safe and She's got the master bathroom and Ella's got her bathroom. And we are literally in this house in separate areas, like for the last six days. So I've, I've seen Ella about a total of 15 minutes, maybe in six days. Uh, and she's right upstairs. Like, so this is, I, I, I understand, I get it. Like I get the whole, like how this is impacting everybody. Um, you know, I, Teaching, you know, this teaching in quarantine, teaching virtually, it's it's not, it doesn't work. I mean, and here's the thing, the expectation, honestly, like we did when we were doing teaching virtually before November 5th, before we had the option of kids to come back. They're like, okay, here's your schedule. It's, you know, it's eight o'clock to nine ten. The classes were 70 minutes, right? They're expecting us to continue our normal schedule. 90 minutes. Yeah, let, that, let that sink in for a second. All right. So you want, you want me to do virtual instruction from 820 to 950, from 10 to 1130, you know, from 1140 to, you know, oh, oh, third period is like 1140 to like 150. It's like the longest period ever. And then from two to two, two to three thirty. like, really? Like, you can't like these kids, you can't, no kid needs to be on the computer six hours a day, first of all. So when I said to you earlier, when you, when you guys were doing all virtual, I was like, you know, how long are y'all, your kid, how long are your classes? How long are your teachers keeping them? I mean, y'all weren't keeping them the whole time, were you? 
Uh, our class periods range from 45 to 50 minutes. Okay. But I know, I know, I know but, they, but we do a lot of breakout sessions and stuff like that. I, listen, yeah, what you, exactly again, what you're saying is, you know, staring at a screen and listening, you know, it's like when me and you back in the day would go to uh, coaches' conventions or, or a, a yeah. trainer convention. You can't sit there and listen to a guy for ninety straight minutes and not wander off and look around and start counting lights and yeah, you know, tiles um, in the ceiling, you know, and you know, designs right. on the designs on the carpet. I mean, like <laughs> yeah, what's like, for lunch? And, and, yeah, and what's for, like yeah? When, when's the when's the lunch breakout session? You know, can I go get some coffee here? You know, can I sneak out? You know. And still get credit for so, for yeah, attending exactly the session. Right. I mean, it's just you know, it's it's human nature. Um, Listen, so, I mean, here's the funny thing I got to bring up, Adam, is you're in your quarantine, um, in your palatial, uh, gated community. I know you have an elevator in your house. Um, you know, but is your is your uh, is your maid come in and serve your dinners? And then, if I'm not mistaken, you did mention that you you bring. Uh, your daughter's dinner or, or their meal or her meal to the door on a tray, correct? It's on, a, it's correct? on a tray. It's yes. It's it's like it's, she's incarcerated. It's on a tray, put it on the floor, knock on the door. Then we leave. That's and then awesome. when she's done, when she's done and she puts it out front, she texts us, say, Hey, it's out. <laughs> go pick it up. We, we send room service. We wash her, we wash our hands. <laughs> we wash, all, you know, we got paper plates. I mean, you know, if, and here's another thing too. I feel like if you tested my blood right now, it would test positive for antibodies because there's no way I have not been exposed to this thing and already had it. Yeah. That's my, that's just my personal feeling because uh -huh. Terry had it. I was around him during like, before, like the two days before he started feeling bad, which is the time when it spreads the most easiest. Um, but we will not use last names here. HIPAA yeah. policies. HIPAA policies. That's right. We don't want to break. We that's ten thousand dollars a shot. So, um, you know, it, it's. It, I, so yeah. I feel like if if I if I was going to get it, I would have had it already. But still, I'm careful. I mean, I'm not going to. You know. I, I, you know what? I, I just want wanted to bring. To get it, so. I just wanted to bring light to the people uh, of how you know some. I mean, the extremes you try to go through to protect your family right and in good and just cause because you know it's uh it's amazing and so as we as we talk about COVID my last point I want to make to you is you know when you go through a drive-through okay and I go through Chick-fil-a for example and they put the food they won't let me hand them the card anymore right okay. uh, I have to scan things myself they put the food on the tray and then make me take it off the tray. So I looked, you know, I talked to my wife and I was like, listen, the Chick-fil-A people touched my food already. Why can't they just hand it to me? Why does it <laughs> on the tray for me to grab it after they've touched it? It well, makes, goes, listen, it makes zero sense. Yeah. So she the said, the protocols well, make wearing, zero sense. Yeah. She says they're wearing gloves. They're wearing the so, same gloves for you that they did for me. If I'm five guys back. Yeah. I, I changing I, gloves after every customer. No. And then I purposely looked and the last five or six times I've gone through Chick-fil-A, there has been uh, zero gloves uh, worn by any of the people. So I just said, hey, last time I went through the drive through I literally said, hand me my food. <laughs> I'd made them take it off the tray and hand it to me. <laughs> well, here's another, here's another COVID, uh, uh, reflection, if you will. Um, and uh, then we'll get to our, uh, our final comment of the night. Um, <laughs> listen, when we're face to face, we're doing this face to face stuff, you know, prior to this, this coming week, right? So you still got wrestling going on, still got basketball going on, right? Your basketball coach, you did wrestling as well. All right. So you got 1500. We had, we, when we started back in January, we had 15, about 1500 kids, start back face to face. That's about 70%. Well, way up from before. So nobody is taking their temperature at the front door as these 1500 kids come in. 
right? Really? No, no. But we're going to take the we're going to take the temperature of every athlete and add another fifteen minutes, you know, to stuff another responsibility to the coaches, and we're going to make them, you know, everybody that comes in the facility do that. But the fifteen hundred kids that come in and are all over the building, we're not going to scan them at all. We're just going to say, hey, wear a mask and socially distance, it, you know, because your desks are six feet, two inches apart, which by the way, if I get another kid in one of my classes, there's no way I can physically separate them without putting the kid's desk in a closet on the other side of the room or on a, across a partition where they can't even see me. So how is that, how is that kid that won't even be able to see me? How are they getting, I mean, there's no way to do this where somebody is not getting the short end of the stick. There's just, there's just not. Well, anyway, so that gets us put, to our, our put them in the hallway and tell them it's noon. Yeah, that's right. That's right. All right. So uh, we'll see how it goes tomorrow. All right. See, we'll see how long I can last with each class tomorrow, but it ain't gonna be 90. I can guarantee you that. All right. Um, human interest, Brees. This was your this was your baby. This was your topic tonight. Um, and uh, I guess I guess you know it's it's worst food, grin and bear it. So explain to our audience kind of what you mean by by that, by that topic. Well, we have been um, blessed uh, by my daughter's uh, boyfriend joining us for dinner a lot uh, over this break, right? Uh, he's also, he's a college student at uh, a different university that she goes to, but all of his classes are online. He doesn't really have to go back to the campus until I think he may mentioned maybe the last week in January, okay? So, you know, I brought this up because I thought, you know what, when I was dating my wife, uh, I was not the expanded eater. My palate was not refined at the moment, okay? As, as many teenagers are uh, growing older, all of a sudden they try new foods and um, they're like, well, you know what, that's not too bad. So, you know, for example, <laughs> meatloaf right I, I i never really grew up on it uh but when you 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 date your uh uh beautiful young lady you you'll try anything correct yes and so meatloaf was one of those things that was like hey it's actually pretty good <laughs> but then there was a one time where i was like okay here we go i'm gonna sacrifice because um you know I, I enjoy hanging out with, and this turned out to be my wife, right? So sauerkraut and wings, sauerkraut. Let me tell you. Hey, well, trust me. I, I come from a family with German heritage. I've had my share of sausage and weenies and, and sauerkraut, which I've I got to tell you, Adam, I, I knew you would, I knew it would hit home with you. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, this was a, it's a Sunday afternoon staple. For us. Well, that is funny. You should mention it. Okay. <laughs> uh, we were actually vacationing. Uh, you know, I had dated my wife for a, a few years and uh, would go on a vacation to the beach with her family. And when, when you go on vacations with her family, it was grandmother, grandfather, aunts, uncles. I mean, it was a whole gamut, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And we would go. And then I was always relegated to the sofa bed because I, you know the outsider right but that's yeah. okay right i mean yeah you're you're nice long trip. For, hey, you're long for the ride right i mean you are long for the ride yeah so the balcony if you need to uh <laughs> you know i was basically the guy that had to stay up the latest because you know they're out there playing cards at 2 a.m you know and i'm just like <laughs> okay is anybody going to bed but anyway <laughs> back to the sauerkraut and weenies uh her grandfather great gentleman um he was the guy that cooked right at these yeah. vacations. And when my wife, you know, and I always, I would always check with my wife or my girlfriend at the time, uh, my wife now and say, Hey, what's for dinner? Cause I'm you know, I'm trying to scout this out because <laughs> again, you need to get, you, know, you need to get prepared. I got to get mentally prepared. You, yeah. You gotta, oh, we're going to have focus. sauerkraut. And you're going to, you're going to love this. Thumbs down, Adam. <laughs> Thumbs down. Probably the, what was, what did it, what was wrong with it? Like probably the worst tasting thing I've ever tasted in my life. The sauerkraut is tremendously awful. Okay. Okay. Well, I mean, 
he must have done it wrong because well i don't I listen i mean do you like do you uh, so you, do you normally like sauerkraut or is it just his that is the sauerkraut? one and only time i've ever tasted it okay so so you're done you're done with sauerkraut. yeah yeah if you ask me to do it again i will throw punch you <laughs> so, he so my to, question to you is <laughs> is there is there a food that you sucked it up basically and you ate it because you did it, you know, for the good, the good of the whole. Was there, was there ever a time that you were like, oh, oh man, I hate this food. I hate green peas. I hate this and that, but my, my girlfriend, my wife, my friend, my whatever. Um, you ever you know, call I, anything. I, I'm extremely lucky because Leslie is a very, very good cook. And uh, she she can grab a recipe and she can cook it for the first time and it is just it's out of this world, almost ten out of ten. I mean, that, that's why I struggled to think of anything that was like, you know, hey, you got to try this. It's really good. Um, so I I don't know that I would I, with Leslie definitely not because um, she you know she, everything she's ever cooked for me or the kids that I've eaten has been top notch good. And, uh, and, and we've eaten it multiple times. Now, as for my family, that's a different story. Um, and i and I'll, and I'll go <laughs> because you can always, there's always something at the, at the Sunday potluck, right. That somebody always makes and man, <laughs> bless her heart. My mom, makes this uh, pea salad and I it's I just I I don't like it at all and, and it and it's and it's one of those deals where you gotta eat you need to you know you've got to show support <laughs> and you, you got to have that one that that you know the, the extra large serving spoon you got to just look if you can hand that's four bites man just get a big the big serving spoon don't top it off don't make it heaping just just enough so it shows up on your plate um and just man just suck it up eat the pea salad for your mom and that's what that's what i did the pea salad it was it was it was the it was it for me it was pea salad now there's another dish that got all kinds of bad reviews but i loved it and uh she would make a congealed salad. You know what a congealed salad is? Oh, sure. Paul? Yeah. Okay. And uh, it got it got a totally different moniker in our family. It became not the congealed salad, but it became known as the concealed salad. <laughs> because nobody exactly knew what was in it. But to me, it didn't matter because it was good. Like, I, I didn't care what was in it. I mean, for those of you that don't know, I mean, a, a, a concealed salad is basically like a, it's like a jello mold. It's like in a bunt cake. And it's like, you know, when you put the jello in a bunt cake, you put all kinds of fruit and that's what's in it. I mean, it's, it's concealed by the jello, but you can't see. And then once you cut into it, you see what you're eating. But to me, it was no matter what kind of jello it was, it, I loved it. And everybody, and I'm talking about from my uncle's, to cousins, they all know about the concealed salad from Thanksgivings and family gatherings. And they give her the hardest time about it, but it's not deserved because it's because it's really good. And that's just me, really good. But the pea salad, the pea salad is definitely something that I grin and bear it and I eat it uh, whenever it is, uh, it is out there to be had. Because here's the thing, by the time I would get to it, Paul, and I might be halfway through the line on a Thanksgiving or something. Dude, it's untouched. <laughs> <laughs> and you feel bad. I mean, you really do. So I, you know, I'm I was always the first, I had to be the first just to dig in just to let, you know, just to show the love, let her know, hey, somebody appreciated and somebody took a chance on the pea salad, even though, man, I would have really rather had two more helpings of mashed potatoes with butter, uh, and and uh and uh and chives on it or whatever but i went with that instead just so she's not you know putting the saran wrap over the whole thing and taking it home because here's the deal somebody in our house is gonna have to eat it because it's gonna be in the fridge until it goes bad uh so i figured i'd, I'd take the top well, off of it but yeah 
Yeah, that's awesome. Well, yeah, hey, listen, so. and this is what the human interest story is all about, right? Yeah. Oh, For everybody yeah. can reflect back on something as you were, you know, grew up on or whatever, and and to just trigger something, and you're like, because looking back on some things, it, it's it's la a lot of laughable situations coming. Oh up. yeah. So oh yeah. The old Grin and Barrett food is also a funny thing. <laughs> so uh, we talk about it quite a bit. So I uh, appreciate you being patient with me as we do, as we do that. But it's uh, kind of uh, it's it's know, comical. So. I think it's good. Yeah, absolutely. We reflect absolutely. back on that. I want to encourage everybody to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Drive Through Sports with Adam and Paul. Follow us on Twitter at D3 Sports. Our our Twitter handle is right there on the screen. You can watch this episode in its entirety, and it'll be uploaded in about an hour or so. So also, it's available. Uh, audio version is available on um, iTunes, Google Podcast, iHeartRadio, and Spotify. And uh, Paul, I'll let you know how the first day back goes tomorrow when we hopefully get together on another episode. But until then, from Brentwood, Tennessee, is Paul Brees. I'm Adam Freeman from Atlanta, Georgia. You've been listening to Drive Through Sports with Adam and Paul. <laughs>